Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Work-Related Musculoskeletal Disorders and Medical Imaging. My name is Kelly Baer and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A period. On the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click on this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the request support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for your choice of the ASRTCE or SDMS CME credit, you must be registered, logged into this computer on the, to this webinar, and then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC and SDMS. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. Kevin Evans. Dr. Evans is professor and director at The Ohio State University College of Medicine and School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. As a researcher and educator, he also serves as department chair of the Radiologic Sciences Respiratory Therapy Educational Programs. Dr. Evans has extensive clinical practice experience, having managed and worked as a sonographer, vascular technologist, and radiographer for 25 years. A true expert in the field, and we are happy to have him with us today. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Dr. Kevin Evans. Doctor? Thank you, Kelly. Um, I just want to begin by thanking uh, Marge Hutchison and all of the uh, directors at IAC and certainly the SDMS for trusting me to present this very important topic. And I want to welcome all of the participants um, to this lecture. Um, I also just want to say, you know, thank you for all that you are doing. This pandemic has been, you know, as you've heard, unprecedented, and your work has been unprecedented. And in my mind, you are all heroes. And so please, you know, take this compliment from me to all of you. I greatly appreciate everything that you have done over the last year and a half in this horrific situation. Um, I sort of feel like as a profession, we are also dealing with another sort of problem that's of equal um, task, and that is the work-related musculoskeletal disorders, which are plaguing our employees. And so that is the focus of our uh, discussion during this time. Um, the objectives for my time with you, uh, the first one is to try to introduce a theoretical framework for improving the ergonomics for both sonographers and for our physicians. I also want to discuss the individual spheres of influence within this particular framework, and they deal with things like tasks that we do, methods, equipment, our environment, and also the way we organize our work. I'll also describe some, in, some innovative means for addressing the risks associated with the ergonomic threats to our workers, which may help, hopefully get us to change some of our protocols. We also are gonna review the impact that a cognitive ergonomic factor may have on the work of our sonographers and our physicians. 
I want to identify some solutions that can uh, be used as a quality improvement activity. And then lastly, I really want to promote the importance of total worker health across our entire um, health system. So let's get started. I searched for a long time to find a model that really I thought captured a lot of the things that go on in uh, our, our um, workspace. And so this is a, an older version of what we call the SEEPS model. I like this model because it does a number of things. It displays all these different spheres of influence that sort of revolve around our patient. And so I feel it does describe, you know, sort of the current, you know, work system. And what's interesting is, of course, that it is focused on the patient, which is, of course, very important. And it's, you know, very much the way I think about things. And of course, if we do all these things properly, it leads to, you know, better health for our patients and certainly satisfaction outcomes. But one of the problem, problems I've had with this model is that actually our employees are sort of buried under the sphere of tools and equipment. And that doesn't sort of make sense to me. So I've decided to improve this a bit, at least in my opinion, and that is to place our staff right in the center of the model, right along with the patient. And I feel like when we talk about ergonomics, you know, we really have to focus not only on the patient, but also on ourselves because when we are you know healthy and when we are doing things that are focused then we can get all the rest of these spheres in alignment and that will lead to even better patient health and satisfaction outcomes and we get the bonus of also making sure our staff is healthy and that we are functional and we actually have a better capacity for work so this to me is the improved hospital work system model that I think better describes the way we should be working. So again, focusing our ergonomics helps us to address any sort of risk factors that might impede us from getting the outcomes that we're looking for. So that's, that's really what ergonomics is about, is sort of making things a systems change. And for me, I also think this is uh, sort of a, a motto that I've sort of been using, and that is that we have to take care in order to give care. And I know a lot of people got into healthcare because they had a passion for caring for patients. And I, and I advocate that, and certainly that was why I got into healthcare. But sometimes our employees they think only of the patient and often they don't think about themselves and that's what i think has has been the root cause of a lot of the uh, injuries that we've seen with our sonographers and also with some of our physicians is that we will sacrifice ourselves in the good uh, idea of helping a patient and i i i understand that but we sort of need to stop and think about this in a different way and that is if we are not healthy, if we are not good, then we're not gonna be there to take care of our patients. So again, I know this is a very simplistic motto, but we really need to change people's thinking and really make them understand that we have to be in good health in order to make sure that others have good health. So hopefully these adaptations to this framework really will guide our discussions today. So let's take a deeper dive into this framework. And I'm gonna start first with the area called tasks. And this is you know, pretty common because you can think about all the different tasks that sonographers and our physicians are involved in as part of taking care of our patients. And these are the things that we wanna think in a very broad way about. We wanna consider all the ways we can improve work and at the same time, lower the risk for potential injury for our uh, sonographers and also for our physicians. And so think very broadly about all the things that we do in the, in, the, in the work of taking care of a patient. And the examples I have here, and this is not an extensive list, but think about the lifting of the patients, pushing the equipment. And those are the things that are happening during the exam, but we should also think about the reporting 
and the worksheets. There's a lot of typing. There's a lot of paperwork and computer work that goes on. And all of that together really describes the job that's being done. So we, we need to be sure that we are considering all the tasks that comprise conducting the patient's exam. And I would say, think about what happens before the exam, during the exam, and after the exam, so that we really are addressing the totality of what's going on and mitigating any risk that would happen to our employee during all of that time. So think about you know, getting patients out of wheelchairs, getting them undressed. Those are things that happen before the exam. Of course, we know what happens during the exam, but we're also doing a lot of post-processing and measurements and things after the exam, and of course, the worksheets and the reporting. So again, the whole gamut has to be considered and checking to see if there's any way we can like lower risk for injury. You have all been well acquainted, I think, with the documentation from publications of our own that talk about that between 80 and 90% of sonographers and vascular technologists who were surveyed are telling us that they were working in pain. And that is a startling factor for me because I feel like if someone is working in pain, then they may not be able to do the job as we would envision it being done. We expect the job to be done with quality and of course, we don't want the patient's safety to be at risk, but errors can happen when we are working in pain. So we have no choice. This is also a big plague that we must address in order to protect the patient and also to protect our workers. So again, when we think about the tasks, you know, there's a lot of things that we do that are physical. But there's also quite a bit of mental things that we're doing. And of course, I'm always in awe of all of you because you're such intelligent people. And that's another reason that you chose this profession because you are so smart. And you use your intelligence when you're looking at the monitor and you use that to recognize pathology or image quality issues. So again, it's not just the physical work that you're doing, it's also the cognitive work that you're involved in. And, and all of that has to be working in concert to make sure that the job is done with quality. So again, I'm just saying, let's think about this in a very holistic manner, because again, I wanna reduce any sort of risk for doing the tasks that are involved, um, both cognitive as well as the physical. So classically ergonomics is thought of as just being about physical postures and positions and how we work with equipment. And, and I'm not denigrating that, that is extremely important. But what I'm saying is we also need to think about the mental, you know, the mental part of the job and how important and vital that is. So, and we really wanna reduce the risk for injury and it should make sense as we think about all the facets of the work. So again, about you know, the exam and also that post-exam because there's a lot of measurements, there's a lot of cognitive function that's happening in that post-processing phase and certainly in the reporting where we pull all of the data together. So there's a lot going on there. All right, so we're gonna move around the model now to the area of methods and tools and equipment. And certainly our methods for imaging patients has dramatically improved with all of the innovations that we have witnessed. And you know, if, if you don't know, I am one of those folks that was an articulated B scanner. So I have really seen so many changes. I feel like I've relearned this job like twice in my life. And this is exciting. I think it's one of the reasons I love sonography because it's constant learning. And a lot of that learning centers around the new methodologies for imaging our patients. Our, our field is continuing to move forward. And the examples I gave here are like sonoelastography, musculoskeletal sonography, B-flow Doppler. I mean, these innovations just keep coming. And I think it's exciting. But, you know, as these methods are improving patient care, we're also investing a lot of time ourselves in trying to make sure that we are competent and that we're keeping up. 
But have we really looked at the work schedules? I mean, do we still have the time allotted to be able to do this, some of these new innovations? So I think we need to not only be excited about, you know, integrating these things into the daily practice, but does the daily practice really allow that to, to sort of come to fruition? And, and it should be done in a way that promotes quality as well as the health of our workers. So we, we really cannot keep doing things the way we've always done them. Technology isn't static and we can't be static. We need to look at our work in a dynamic way. What ways can we adapt or rethink so that we can really work smartly and also safely? That's so critical right now. So some of you, I think, may have heard about the uh, WRMSD Grand Challenge that's being sponsored by almost every one of our organizations, which is really admirable. And uh, this, this group of organizations has asked me to lead a research project. And um, I think this is really important because I conceived of this as a longitudinal survey. We've done single surveys of, of cohorts of sonographers and physicians, but we've never looked at this in a longitudinal manner. So this will be the first time that we've taken data on sonographers and physicians over an extended period of time. What I really envision from this project is a way of building a national database, and we're calling it sonography well-being. We really think that when we capture this data over time, that we will better understand some of the risks that our workers are under for musculoskeletal injury. And in May, we launched our first survey, and I'm hoping some of you were able to participate. We have approximately about 3,500 surveys that are 100% completed. So thank you to those of you who did participate in that high quality manner. And it is about sonographers as well as our physicians. So we have responses from both groups, which is really exciting. In October, I'll be launching the second survey and that will be going to those of you that check the box saying that you wanted to continue to contribute. And I really thank you for that because your continued participation is gonna be what builds out this national database. And this longitudinal effort will perhaps tell us about what's going on in the acute phase, but then some people may get better or some may go chronic. And again, we've never been able to get our arms around this. So I'm really excited about leading this particular research project. And I will certainly be able to give you updates as we move along. Okay, so let's get back to the methods by which we're working. And I, uh, I'm so happy to have a picture of Dr. Liu, who's a very close friend. He is a radiologist who uh, works in China and he uh, works specifically with ultrasound. And we see Dr. Liu sharing a picture with me. Uh, he's so excited he just bought this adjustable chair and he wanted me to see this. So it's great. Um, I was you know, glad to see this, but if you notice, Dr. Liu is in his new chair, but he still has an older machine, and this happens to be where they do some teaching. So it is older equipment in the teaching space, but it's not adjustable. So although his chair is adjustable, and actually the table he has beside him is also adjustable, the, the machine isn't. So there's a mismatch here, and that's what sort of causes a risk for potential injury. We consider this interface between the worker and the equipment, we call this micro ergonomic interface. And we have to be sure that we can facilitate um, the ability to make adjustments, not just with the chair, but with the equipment, the table, having our patient move closer to us. All of these are physical adjustments that promote the employee to be able to work safely and with comfort. And so I, I think this picture is really illustrative of what we're, what we're striving to do. And many of you understand what I'm talking about because you don't all have the adjustability that you need. 
So this infographic that I'm providing, I think helps to illustrate even more because here you see the diagram and it really talks about, you know, how to make the adjustments, not just with the monitor at your, you know, at, you know, even with your head so that you can see straight forward. It also talks about where's the keyboard and how to adjust your, your seating. All, all of this has to be adjustable because each of us is different height. And so everything has to be customized. We know from some of our own published research that our sonographers and, and our physicians are most often complaining about pain in their shoulder neck and forearm. It's really prevalent through our, through our groups. So we need to reinforce with our workers to sort of mitigate that by letting them do customized workspaces. So again, this infographic really is about, you know, the workstation, but I think you could also think about this as we showed in the previous picture about the ultrasound workspace. We need to encourage our staff to customize their workspace. Don't just rush in and start an exam for however it was left by the previous person because that person may be smaller or taller than the previous uh, person. So again, just telling people, take a minute, slow down, clean the room and adjust it so it fits you in a better physical way. Now, I don't need to, I'm singing to the choir here, I know, the portable bed exams are just killing our staff because they go into spaces to work with patients that are not of their own control, right? They're in a nursing space. And again, we have the passion of our worker who thinks, well, I really don't want to trouble the patient. So I'll just put up with what I see. I don't want to ask anybody because I don't want to, they're all under so much stress. I don't want to bother them. These are all wrongheaded sort of, of, of thoughts because this is what causes a risk for injury because we just think I'll work the way I find things. And we got to stop this because this is what is escalating injury. So again, whether we're at the workstation, whether we're in our own exam room or whether we're at the bedside, we have to stop and make as many adjustments so that we are comfortable and able to perform our job with quality. All right, so this is another diagram and this is from OSHA. And I wanna explain this because when you first look at it, it sort of doesn't make a lot of sense, but let me, let me help you. And first I wanna uh, point to the bottom of this triangle, which has PPE listed. And this might seem not intuitive because we think of PPE as probably the most important thing we've had to deal with during this pandemic. It's what's kept us alive. And here it is listed as least effective. So that doesn't sound right. But what they're saying here is that PPE is individually worn on yourself, but it doesn't keep you from physically moving in an incorrect way. So yes, it protects you from bacteria and germs as much as possible, but it doesn't keep you from physically getting into postures or positions that could cause you to have you know, an ergonomic injury. So hopefully that makes a little more sense. Now we move up to what is administrative controls. And that is the change in the way that we're working, which we were just talking about, you know, working at the bedside, like that's not a good place for us to be. So, you know, administratively, are we gonna allow that to happen or are we not? So as you see, we move up higher on this hierarchy of OSHAs and we start to understand what they're asking us to think about. Engineering controls are really the way the manufacturers are putting together our equipment and are the buttons and the keyboards, you know, easy to get to, can we adjust our monitors? Those are sort of the engineering things that we interface with. Notice that the only way to get be most effective is to completely eliminate risk. Well, let's get real here. That's not possible. Working with patients, there's always going to be some risk. So what we want to do is we really want to live more in the middle of this triangle where we sort of, you know, do as much mitigation as we can of our risk and also have a little risk that we can sort of manage. So that's what this is talking about, looking at engineering controls and sort of 
doing as much substitution as we can to sort of keep our workers as safe as possible. And again, this is something from OSHA. I think it has great value as we consider, you know, ways, new ways to think about working. All right, let's move on then to the next sphere, which is called environment. And I think this is a really, really under underappreciated area. This is talking about the hospital or medical center that we work in. And this is referred to as macro ergonomics. This is the highest level. And they really want us to think about, you know, where the risk for injury can either be influenced in a positive or negative way. And we really, this is the area we really want to promote the idea of total worker health. So who is responsible for our environment? And in some ways, this is also, you know, something that you probably already know, but the hospital medical director is probably one of the highest level people that's in charge of our environment. And, um, and surprisingly, they're not as keyed in on some of the things that we're interested in. They're, they're looking at the, the patient, of course, the center of everything, and they're worried about, you know, legal ramifications. Um, there's, there's a lot on these people's plates. They, they really are the head of the hospital. Um, next to that person is the hospital quality assurance department or committee. And my interactions with these folks, you know, it's a lot about, you know, patient safety, misadministration of medications, sentinel events, and trying to get to the bottom of root cause for these sorts of things. So again, I'm not sure that they're really tuned into this idea that work-related musculoskeletal disorders are happening. Now, the chair of our department, they've been reading these, these uh, articles. They are, they, they do know things about this. So we're finally getting to somebody who knows something about our, our problem. And of course, many of the technical directors who are in this conference are well-versed in the uh, risk to employees and our managers are right on the front line. So they, so they know quite a bit. So here you see sort of a strata of the not so well-informed to the really well-informed. So how do we get all these people on the same page? Literally, because we have to get them all in concert if we're gonna make substantial changes in the way that we work. So I was very fortunate to have a grant from the Ohio Bureau of workers' compensation. And I had it for several years, and it was really about finding out how to influence this macro level of, of you know, sort of the leaders who really govern the environmental area of the hospital. And so what I did was I devised a qualitative research project where I went in and did um, interviews with, a, with many administrators and hospital directors all across the state of Ohio to really find out what they knew about work-related musculoskeletal injury and disorders, and frankly, to find out you know, what, what information they didn't have, which I gotta say was sort of striking. And the most common remarks from these sessions probably isn't a surprise to you, but um, the idea that we had statistics and anything about you know, imaging technologists and our imaging physicians they were just like, well, this, I think this is a nursing problem. You, you should go talk to nursing. Well, I'm married to a nurse and my sister's a nurse. I know a lot about nursing, but nursing to me has its own exquisite problems and issues with potential work-related injury. And it's at the bedside, but our folks also have risk and it's different type of risk. So I could really see where there's problems because there was just a complete lack of knowledge and really what knowledge they did have was all about nursing. So that's very frustrating in many ways. So I used a grounded theoretical approach. I looked through hours of interviews and I tried to come up with some general themes that I heard from the many, many administrators that I had met with over the course of this project. And so what I wanna provide for you are a list of these themes that I heard recurrently. The first one is that administrators I met with 
they would like to know more about interventions that we would propose, but they, they want to see this done in a team approach. And that's great. I'm all about teams. And they also want to be included in that team as decisions are made, which I'm all about that. Next, they really want to see data, which I love data. So data is very important to them. It's useful. But the kinds of data that they're looking for are things like injury data, um, interventional assessment data, some of the stuff we don't have right now. So again, I think some of the longitudinal data that I'm gathering through this survey and the national registry we're building, this will probably be something that's very pivotal uh, as we use it to give data of this kind. They also talked about barriers to obtaining and utilizing workplace interventions. Lots of tools and the equipment are on the market, but they really want us to evaluate this from a patient safety standpoint not just about employees. And I, I think we're all tuned into that. We wanna keep patient and employees safe. And of course the costs are always important. So they want to talk about that too. Lastly, but probably most importantly, they all wanted to see communication throughout their organizations done in both a vertical as well as horizontal manner, a total sharing of knowledge about risks and safety measures. And I gotta say, this is one of my favorite things. I love to communicate. And again, we, we can do this. This is something that is easy to do because again, nursing has sort of been the one that's published the most and talked a, a lot about their risks. We need to get equal time for communicating about ours. So let me give some examples of ways that we can use these key components. To, to do the kind of uh, communicating that we need to do. So the first one again was about interventions that administrators wanted to see. And I think, you know, you can think about ways to implement this by having like focus groups that are interdisciplinary and talk about ways to, dis, uh, you know, purchase tools that, you know, a group of, of medical professionals can use to help, you know, provide ergonomic relief for risk. So again, thinking about ways to get groups together, um, nursing, you know, bringing them to the table, what sorts of equipment have they used? What have they found to be helpful? And does it work with us or does it not? And so that's, that's an important way to work at, you know, work through the interventions that administrators wanna see. Data, again, so helpful. And since we don't have ours ready yet, one of the other ways that they look for data is through occupational health. So we have to encourage our employees, if they have an injury or they have pain, to feel comfortable going to, to occupational health and reporting in, because if they go outside the system, then there's no record that they're having an issue. And so then we don't have the data. And I know that they're fearful about going there. They worry that this is gonna you know, cost them their job. We have to assure them that they have safety in reporting so that we have clean data to share. The other thing that I personally had a lot of issues with when I was a manager was if we had someone who went out and then they came back, we tried to devise what we called light duty, things that they could do, perhaps like getting patients ready or you know, doing some clerical work, but keeping them in the workforce. That's important. Um, it can be a little frustrating for people to do light duty because they would rather go in and work with patients, but we want them to come back healthy and not get re-injured. We also have to watch their coworkers because they are picking up the slack for those that have been out. So we don't want to escalate risk on those that were left behind. So it's really important to think again about all the workers, light duty and those that aren't that are doing heavy duty so that we don't cause more injury. The next one was the barriers they talked about to utilizing workplace interventions. And here my suggestions are, you know, it's about pulling some information from the, the manufacturers or the vendors so that you can get that in front of administrators. And really what we when we bring this information together, we're talking not just about the employee. Again, we want to give equal time 
to how this is going to make a, you know, a difference in the quality of the patient's care. So again, it's about putting the patient and the employee, like I said, in the center of attention equally and showing how we're going to get a benefit for both of them. So again, if patients are important, but our employees are too, because again, they're not going to be there to give good care if we don't take care of them. Lastly, that communication thing. And I just think it's really important to just consistently have the message that you are promoting about you know, ways of mitigating the risk for injury at work. And we need to be able to be consistent. We need to be able to say it and we can't get frustrated because goodness knows I have heard a lot of crazy things, but I don't show emotion. I keep myself together and I just say it again and again, and I'm just super persistent. And that's what it takes to get that word across and get everybody to understand the importance of the message. Now, I threw these slides in here because um, I did go to Washington, D.C., and it was an amazing day that I spent there. And, you know, I really uh, was to be honest, a little frightened when I went because I was paired up with a professional lobbyist. And our day that we were there was about, you know, promoting, um, you know, the importance of the health and safety of our sonographers and our sonologists. And so they had all these appointments for me to go. And I'm like running across the street from the Capitol building to the administrative building back and forth to meet all the different Congress people. And I, of course, our senators. And um, you know, I just think that we are the most accurate spokespeople. We know what's going on. We can tell our own story. And when I was working with the lobbyist, I just said to him, I, I'm sorry, I, I have a specific thing that I'm going to do, and I hope you don't mind, but I have things I need to say. And so I just did my thing. And at the end of the day, I looked at him and I said, I, I bet you're really frustrated with me. And he said, oh my God, Kevin, you were amazing. <laughs> I, I am a very humble person and I was not looking for praise, but I just, I just have to say it my way. I just have to do it my way. And I felt it was very, very effective. I was, yes, talking to Rob Portman, but I also was able to, to look laterally, very horizontal and also talk with the staffers. And I actually got a private meeting with his health policy um, you know, lead staff person. So yes, talking vertically, talking horizontally, saying, staying on message, being consistent, that's what I'm talking about. That's how to be effective. So I was really fortunate to get to meet Lauren at a private meeting later in the day. When I met with her, you know, I started talking about, you know, patient care because that's we have I had to find a, a hook, a way for us both to get together and have this conversation. And I kept stressing, you know, that patients get the highest quality of care when our providers are healthy and they're supported. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprising, she has grandparents and her parents who live here in Ohio. So she was very worried about her grandparents' medical care. Well, that was a great space for us to meet in and talk about how, Lauren, are your grandparents going to get good health care? It's through the, the health and safety of our medical workers. So, you know, finding that way to sort of like meet, she's in her 20s, like she's not worried about her own health. She's worried about her grandparents' health. But nevertheless, it was a place where we could talk and have meaningful dialogue about the importance. And what I wanted her to do was to advocate for us. And I felt it was very successful. So let's move back into what we call work organization. This is a little bit different than environment. And how do we organize the way we work? And I think it, you have to sort of step back and look at this. A lot of the ways that we are organized is, is sort of a, from a historical perspective. I mean, certain units in our hospitals and medical centers, they were just organized the way they were back in the 1900s, maybe. There, there was like units, uh, you know, 
nursing units, a lot of the way they, things are shaped are from the old days. And if you think about radiology, historically, you know, they were always going to the bedside giving diagnostic exams to, to chronically ill patients. But isn't it time that we start reimagining the way we give care? I mean, are we really stuck with this historical sort of like framework of the way hospitals and clinics are put together? We really need to look at this in a different way. I mean, look at your emergency medicine. They, if you go into an emergency department, many of them are still organized in a very similar way. And maybe that makes people feel comfortable, but I think we need to relook at this. I mean, sick patients that are have trauma are in these bays or pods. I mean, can we really get ultrasound equipment into these little spaces? I don't know it's safe and I don't think we're very productive. I also think about OBGYN, which historically always evaluated patients in private little exam rooms. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been in some of those rooms and you can hit your elbow on some of the walls. I mean, we really got to think of a new way of organizing our work because these spaces are not conducive to giving good care. I love this picture. It's a very close friend of mine, Dr. Peng. He is working in the People's Hospital in China. And he sent me this picture of him and he was showing me he's doing an ultrasound guided laser, thyroid laser ablation. So take a, a look at this picture. I mean, Dr. Peng, he's really very talented physician. The ultrasound equipment, uh, yeah, it's pulled into this little bay and you can see a curtain's been pulled. And there's all these physicians crowded around because he's such a luminary person and they're all like photographing him. They're looking at the equipment. He has an assistant there that's handing him instruments. I mean, I don't know what the patient must have thought of this. They, maybe the patient thought they were getting great care because there were so many physicians in the room. But honestly, this is crowded. I mean, this is not a good work organ organization. I mean, is this conducive for the patient and the physician? I don't think so. And I, I don't know that Dr. Peng really has, you know, any flexibility. Can he really move? anywhere between the patient and the equipment. It, it doesn't look like things are organized very well. I don't even think the lighting is adjustable where he's at. So, you know, we really have to look at some of these classic spaces and say, you know what, this isn't right. We have to redo this because it is contributing to possible injury. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but I think the idea about cognitive ergonomics is important, like how we think. And, you know, nursing's done a lot of publication in this area about bed alarms and overhead announcements and, you know, all this noise that goes on at the bedside and how it interferes with them giving care. Well, actually, I think, and I have experienced this myself many times, the NICU, I mean, the ICU, I can just remember trying to concentrate while IVACs are beeping and people are talking. It's very distracting and it could cause errors, mental as well as physical errors. So we really need to think about this. How can we calm down all this noise? Because it is it, it was going to impact our patient's care, I think. So again, look at the way we, even OB exams, how we have we used to have before the pandemic, you know, people in the rooms. It, it's important, but all these questions, it, it's very disruptive. It's cognitive dis disruption and it, it, it's not good for us. So I think, you know, thinking again, how do we reorganize the work? Is there a way that we can still get quality and still provide bonding if, if we're talking about OB, but not cause cognitive disruption? So again, it, it's about like maybe we're organizing the way we do the exam by saying, you know, I, I personally used to say this to my patients, I'm gonna do the measurements and some images, and I'm gonna be rather quiet while I get this work done. And then I promise you, I'm gonna provide you with some time so that you can watch and you can get you know, family members involved. I sort of structured the way that the exam was gonna be run. It let them know why I was doing what I was doing and it really did, you know, cause a lot less distraction. 
I never had a negative um, comment made. I never had, I always had very positive responses from my patients. So again, we have to feel that we have the opportunity to restructure because we do have to make sure that everyone's having a quality experience, employee as well as our patient. It's really vital to cut down all this cognitive disturbance. And really what um, you know, CDC and NIOSH are stressing, I mentioned this before, is total worker health. How do we promote this? How do we look holistically and make sure that we are reinforcing, improving the well-being of our workforce? And never has this been more important than this pandemic. We are having trouble keeping people. We're having tr trouble attracting students to these areas. We have to make this, we have to do better. And the way to do better is make sure that we are caring for our employees so that they can give great quality care to the patients. So important. I also think this makes, of course, a great quality improvement initiative. So I know all of you are very well schooled in the Deming cycle. So think about ways in your own um, institution that you can you know, make some changes. And it starts with planning. You know, what can you do to to mitigate risk. And you don't wanna take on too many things. You might wanna say, you know, I'm gonna make a change in the way we organize our work. And you're gonna to plan to do that. And you're gonna to try to get as many of your staff and your administrators, get that team going and talk about ways to make small changes. And so the do part is where you're gonna actually put it into action, but you're also gonna take some data to see if, it, if in fact that does make a difference. You'll check your data to make sure that, you know, you are getting what you expected and if there's any sort of changes that need to be made to the plan. And then finally, you'll get to the point where you can act on it, depending on what your pilot data shows and see bit by bit, we make these changes and they're always to improve, you know, the experience for both the patient and the worker, but we'll have to continuously monitor make sure that in fact we are getting the change we are looking for so this this idea of mitigating risk for injury it makes a great quality improvement project for you why do we want to do this well one of the outgrowths of doing a quality improvement project like this is it definitely improves the workers experience especially if they're involved in these changes it can increase the quality of the exam and it might actually do something about you know the cost for ill time you know we've been using contingents when people are out you could actually maybe show a cost benefit to doing it this way you improve productivity likely because people are happy and they're working in a comfortable way and we're not working in pain which is going to you know also be a decrease maybe in insurance that is being having to be utilized. So again, it's about you know the quality uh, of the study. The workers uh, are happy, and I'm hoping you'll get more referrals. I mean, right now it seems like we've got lots of work to do, but as we look to the future, you know, how do we make sure that our the folks that are providing patients to us recognize that we're a quality business and that we will see increases in revenue because of the changes we made. So again, reducing our risk for injury is going to give us a tremendous return our, on our investment if we do it right. So again, I want to thank everyone for your attention. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that we have about 10 minutes left at the end here. Um, Marge is going to come back on and we're going to try to entertain some of your questions. Again, thank you for your participation and really think a lot about how we come out of this pandemic doing better. Okay, thank you very much. And at this time, we'll begin the Q&A session. From IAC, I'd like to introduce Marge Hutchison, our Director of Accreditation for Vascular Testing, assisting with the Q&A session today. Marge, would you like to start us off? I would. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Dr. Evans, for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, there are many, many questions. So let me just start by saying, if we don't ask your question, we will answer it via email in a, at a later time. Uh, for as many questions as there are, probably a third of them are regarding how many tests per day 
should a sonographer do in an eight hour period? Uh, and then along with that, it's how much rest should you get in between and how can the sonographer manage their schedule? Great, Marge. And that is like the, the most important question. I get asked that question a lot. And so here's my response to that. And I, I don't think anyone's going to be surprised. I don't personally believe it's the number specifically. I think really it's about the intensity of the exams that people are having to do. I mean, the prevalence of obesity is something, it's, it's an epidemic It's of its own obesity, and it plays out in our patients. So when I think about being an ultrasound manager, you know, we would have a, like a board and we would assign sonographers to different exams. And I, I would assign people to do exams. I wouldn't have a clue what the patient looked like. And sometimes I'm wondering what's taking so long in that exam room. I go in there and I find it's a very obese patient. So, you know, the workers in there and they're having to physically exert themselves to get through that exam because of that obese patient. And they need rest after having done something like that. So again, what we're going to do with our, um, our, our national database survey is we're actually going to invite some people to do what I call uh, uh, exam diary. And I think through these exam diaries is how we're really going to understand this because I don't think it's the number, I think it's the intensity of what's been done. Because you can have someone who does 10 to 11 exams on you know, a moderate to thin set of patients and that it's a lot, but it's not gonna match someone who did four or five obese patients in a row and they didn't get a break. So until we get some of this data, I, I don't like to see a rule made about a specific number because I actually think if I did 11 obese patients, it would probably be career ending. So again, it's not number. And these, this is my personal opinion, which we'll see play out through you know, the, the, the national database. But I believe these exam diaries are the key to this because when we see the number and, and the intensity and rest or no rest, I think we will be able to give better guidance because now just saying a number, I actually think it's harmful. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, there's also many questions about how do we uh, educate and engage our, our leadership, our HR people, their uh, employee health department. Uh, there are some people that have uh, noted here that they've kind of been, uh, they've kind of been, uh, somebody's kind of been mean to them because they are relating a problem. I know, and I've experienced this myself. And right now, I don't know, I think this is a national problem. I mean, a lot of HR people are are getting out and, and that is, is bad. Um, I feel like I've had a new HR person every six months. And so it's very frustrating because just when I get an HR person and I've got them to understand our positions and sort of, you know, sort of the stress that people are under, then all of a sudden that person's gone. So I have decided to really go all the way up the chain. <laughs> no surprise. I am talking to the vice president of the university's HR. I'm going to the top because I wanna see people hired who understand the health professions because that's really sometimes the root cause. They're getting people in here, they don't pay them very much and they're learning on the job. And that's detrimental to me and my workers. So I go right to the top and say, look, this is a unique group of workers that have specific things that need to be addressed and I say this about our physicians too, because a lot of misunderstanding about our physicians are in room scanning. So that has to be you know, explained to these HR people because they don't get it. They think, I don't know what they think our physicians are doing. So it is about educating, but I have given up on the HR reps. I mean, I still talk to them, but I have gone straight to the top because that is where the hiring's done. And I want hiring done about with 
the understand that these people need to be oriented and really understand you know the positions that they're in charge of because there's a lot of wasted time when you're not getting the right people in these hr positions so i think i've been quite you know i I've really given myself up about this. I go right to the medical director. I go right to the top of HR. I, I, I just go there because that's where the power is and that's where the decisions are made and I wanna be heard and that's the way to do it. All right. Um, along with that, there are uh, many people that are interested in the survey that you mentioned. Um, can they still participate? Where can they get the outcomes and those types of things? Yes, so I'm so thrilled that people are interested. You know, uh, like I said, we have over 3,000 people that already completed 100% of the survey. Um, but the second survey, we can't have people come in at that point because the questions are different. So we're going to be launching a website uh, specific to the survey so that people, it'll be like a dashboard. Um, surprise, the SEEPS model is the front page of our website so that you could see exactly how this all works, but it will give you an invitation to do the first survey. You do have to do the first survey because it gives us some of that demographic information. And then the second survey is about burnout. It's about exams. It gives you the option to do the exam diaries. It also asks you if you would like to do a qualitative interview about the way that COVID has changed your work. That's what's in the second survey, but we won't be able to contact you unless you've done the first survey. So through our website for the survey is how you will be able to get into the first one. And I haven't got it completely up and running yet, but as soon as I do, all of the sponsoring organizations will give a link to that. So be patient. Um, as I am doing the data analysis, putting the surveys together, it's a lot of work. I only have three people helping me, so be patient, but we'll get there. But thank you for that interest. Uh, Kevin, what's the name of the group so that they can look it up on the internet? It, I don't have it ready to go. So it, it, it's gonna be Sonography Wellbeing will be, the, okay. will be the website, but it's not out on the web yet, but that will okay. be the way you search for it. Mm -hmm. All right, um, there's a lot of questions and comments how about uh, folks who their employers and whatever kind of just disregard their issues. So is there some place they can go where they can learn exercises for their various uh, situations? Yeah, I think we have to be careful because, you know, uh, I think our going to your primary care physician is important if, you know, I said earlier about occupational health, you know, going there first. I know people get frustrated because there's not a lot of resources there, but once you've documented with, you know, occupational health that you do have an injury or potential injury, you probably need to go to your primary care physician because they know your medical history. And I think that's important because if you have underlying health conditions, certain things may not be good for you. And that's where I get a little annoyed sometimes at some of the national meetings, I see physical therapists and stuff standing up telling people to do things. And I'm thinking, you can't say that because you don't know if the person has osteoarthritis, you don't know if the person's got you know, a disc that is protruding in their back. I mean, we have to be very careful by giving carte blanche like exercises to everyone. I think your PCP knows you and knows what you are capable of. And there's lots of modified um, exercises. I personally think yoga is a really great therapeutics and there's modified yoga that you can do. So again, working through your PCP who knows you and make sure that your medical condition is conducive to doing things gives you a personalized sort of exercise program and I just don't want to see anyone get hurt because they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. And hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, and I think the last question, um, if you can address something that will help people who are required to do bedside testing, we all know that that's a difficult situation. <laughs> yes, that's the bane of my existence because I did a ton of it. Um, I really, I know it's not the, it's not the perfect 
solution, but I just insist on customizing um, the the bedside exam. I, I just go right to the nurse who's in charge of the patient and say, look, I cannot get a quality exam on this patient. You're going to have to get some people in here. You're going to have to help me. Because if I start pulling on these people by myself, I'm going to get hurt. So we will probably take a lot longer to get this exam done, but it's going to make sure that I am going to mitigate my risk. So they're going to have to move equipment. They're going to have to move the bed. They're going to have to help me move the patient. They have to get things out of my way so I can get my equipment positioned properly so that I have the flexibility to have that micro ergonomics that's at maximum benefit to me. I'm customizing that workspace just like I would my workstation at my home or in my office. I'm adamant about it. I'm as polite as I can be, but I'm as, as adamant as I can be about it. I won't do the exam until I get it customized. I won't shortcut it because if I shortcut it, I'm going to hurt myself. So I just really advocate, stand up for yourself. And my wife, as I said, is a nurse and I've, I've talked to her about this. And she actually said to me, she goes, we do that for our coworkers on the unit. So we really should be doing that for all the folks that come on the unit. So I actually have a nurse who, <laughs> yes, she's my wife, but she did say that she advocated insistence that we customize the workspace. So there you go. Well, thank you, Kevin. We're going to turn it over to Kelly to um, wind it down. Okay, great. Thanks again, Marge. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Thanks again, everyone. Um, and we thank you for your presentation today. Um, please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive your continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Work-Related Musculoskeletal Disorders in Medical Imaging. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluation tab then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and anytime thereafter through the CE transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation. <music>